Hi, and welcome back to Continual Horror. Tonight, we are going to be talking about a lot of people's gateway into the joys of horror and film. Nothing other than the studio that brought Christopher Lee, David Prowse, Oliver, Re- uh, Oliver Reed, Bella Lugosi, and so many others to bring <laughs> back and reprise the characters of Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Mummy. It is another, none other than Hammer Films. So tonight, we're going to be having a bit of fun with Hammer. I am your host, Jim Nettles. But before we get started, let's see who else has joined us for this little fun party. <clears throat> uh, so, Clay, you're up first. Oh, good. Hi, my name is Clay Griffith. Uh, I am an author. I usually write with my wife, Susan. So we are Clay and Susan Griffith. We're the authors of the Vampire Empire series and the Crown and Key trilogy, both of which are Victorian themed and both of which are heavily influenced by my childhood watching Hammer films. So uh, this, this is a big deal. Bill? Hi, I'm Bill Mulligan. I'm a high school science teacher, podcaster, indie filmmaker, and my first book round will be published later this year from Falstaff Books, which I'm very excited about. And I love Hammer. I've loved it since I was 11 years old, and I'll love it till the day I die. Fraser? I'm Fraser Sherman. I write historical fantasy. I also write movie books and also more movie books put out by McFarland. <laughs> I will have a self-published steampunk novel and a fifth movie book coming out later this year. And Greg. Hi. I I just noticed that my name on the thing is Gregorius U, which is my uh, pen name for when I uh, do art. I am a cartoonist. I was doing a political cartoon from 2003 to about 2012, and then I decided that it was not worth continuing political cartoons because I was getting uh, death threats and other things like that. Um, I'm I am also a writer, and I am working on a graphic novel on the uh, uh, Hanako San urban legend from Japan, and uh, I am also the husband of. The famous G. Marie Ward, whom everybody knows from me, uh, Continual. We we might have met her once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start in with a fun question. So, Clay, I'll, you'll go up first with this one as well. Okay. What is your first memory of a Hammer film? Uh, likely my first memory is Horror of Dracula, which is probably a lot of people's first memory um i i'm too it's hard for me to say i'm too young for anything but i'm too young to remember most of the the core horror hammer horror stuff in the theaters uh my introduction came on the good old-fashioned friday and saturday night late shows and um i was a dracula kid dracula is the most influential novel i ever read And um, so the Dracula movies uh, that Hammer did were right up my street. And Horror of Dracula was like Gone with the Wind or or Casablanca to me when I was 12. It was it was just amazing. And it's it's still the most important Hammer film. It may well be the best, actually, but certainly the most important to me going forward. How about you, Bill? Now, I think probably the first Hammer film I saw was um, One Million Years B.C., but I didn't really think of it as a Hammer mm-hmm. film. It was a Harryhausen film. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the first Hammer film proper, I went to a double feature as a kid and saw, I believe it was Blood from the Mummy's Tomb and, most importantly, Vampire Circus. Mm-hmm. And for a 11- or 12-year-old kid who was raised on the Bell Lugosi and Boris Karloff films, to suddenly see all this red blood and naked bodies and <laughs> gore. What seemed at the time to be unbelievable gore now seems very tasteful in comparison <clears throat> to what we have now. It was a revelation, and I don't think I've ever recovered. How about you, Fraser? Uh, let's see. The first one that I can recall was catching Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter 
on TBS one summer during college. And I think the next was uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. They felt I'd seen a lot of the universal horror films in syndication. These felt very different with a very distinctive style. And let's face it, the women were stunning. Martin Beswick, Carolyn Monroe, Kate Mara, Lala Ward and Vampire Circus, mm -hmm. and so many others, which when you're in your teens and 20s is a nice factor. How about you, Greg? Okay, well, I, I started it when, uh, when we, uh, before we started, actually. So I am eight years old. It's 1959. Uh, my parents have taken my brother and me to go see Peter Pan in the marquee, uh, the lobby of the hotel of the um, of, of the movie theater is a marquee uh, card for House on Haunted Hill. Oh, mom, we're not going to see that. No, that's not going to be here. So I, we go in and we get coming attractions and it's horror of dracula zoom i went under the seat but i kept peeking every time i could hear an, the announcer say another word and i remembered every single thing in the trailer from when, when i saw it again on turner classic movies i did see horror of dracula in the theater actually <clears throat> finally when i was in college but Ever since then, I've been a fan. Ironically enough, I think the first Hammer film I ever saw was Alan Quartermain. Was oh. a replay of the Quartermain movies, which then kind of, I think, led into... Because I saw Alan Quartermain before I ever... The old Alan Quartermain before I ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark as a little kid. And then, but I mean, it was one of those things of, of course, that is just before and right about the, the start of the horror years. And then after that, I think the first one I saw was the um, Frankenstein mm. before I even saw the Dracula films. Now I love all the old Dracula films. Absolutely love them all. Even the one where Christopher Lee doesn't grunt a word the entire <laughs> time out of protest just this look of consternation throughout the entire thing like blah 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 why am i oh yeah paycheck write me the paycheck let me keep going even that one is a tremendous amount of fun so bill since you're a high school teacher and and lover of film what from the hammer era has kind of come in and, and maybe even inspired you a bit? Because we can, I think we can even see maybe a few props around there, or maybe that's just a student cast yeah. in concrete. No, there, there's um, a mummy somewhere in the back there. Um, I learned nothing from from uh, the Hammer Mummy film, which I love because if I if I paid attention, they said it took six hours or so to wrap up Christopher Lee as the mummy, and I figured <laughs> we could do it faster. And it took six hours to wrap up someone <laughs> as a mummy. It's it's not easy. Uh, I think what I took away from Hammer, what I just love about them, the production values. These were not high budget films by most standards, but they sure looked high budget. I mean, when you compare um, the Hammer product to what was coming out from America, there's just no comparison. Everything looks so lush that the British just had a really good sense of style. Even their low-budget films just look good. These these were craftsmen who took pride in making sure the photography was razor sharp and the colors, if there were any, were just beautiful. Directors like Terrence Fisher, no matter what they worked on, gave it a hundred percent, and I just love that look. It's, it's you can almost immediately tell you're watching a Hammer movie. Just anytime you turn it on, just look at how good it looks. Even when he gave Roger Corman a budget, he didn't do it, didn't do it as well as Hammer. Yeah. Amer I the American Rob films have energy and, and they have their own charms, but there's definitely something about the Hammer films that just screams value. They well, really I, made use of that Bray studio. All I mean, yeah. it, uh, they reuse so many sets, but they redress them so well that you don't see it. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. So, Frazier, 
yeah. in the books you've written. How much stuff have you written about the Hammer films, and how much has that inspired some of the stuff you've worked on? As far as actually writing in my film books, my time travel book, Now and Then We, tra we Time Travel, includes a brief mention of prehistoric women, which involves the protagonist going back to a lost land where Martine Beswick, who makes a magnificent evil queen, leads the brunettes to rule over the blondes. It is not good, but Beswick almost makes it worth watching. In terms of influence, nothing direct, but Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, which works in Birkenhair, Jack the Ripper, Dr. Jekyll, who also turns into, again, Martin Beswick. It is so wild lumping them all together, and it has such, a, as was just said, a lush visual style. It is something, if I were going to try to imitate a Harriman movie, that is probably the one I would go for. So, Greg, what have you got for us? So, for you, what is it about the Hammer films is that maybe he's coming as inspiration or the things that you just really love to draw off of? I, well, I love the, the performances of Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, I, especially Peter Cushing, because I imitate him very well. And <laughs> a, uh, but the the photography is the the Jack Asher use of color, um, the the music with uh, James Bernard Bernard whatever uh, however he pronounces his last name, um, it all makes this uh, a Hammer movie. And of course, Terrence Fisher's directing and Jimmy Sangster's scripts. Well. Sangster scripts don't always make sense, <laughs> but I like them anyway. <laughs> Wait, Hammer films were supposed to make sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, that no horror movie, even from from Dracula on, uh, there was always a. Uh, I mean, the original Bela Lugosi one. There was always a rush to the finish, so things got left out. And Sangster kept in that uh, in that tradition. So Clay, how about you? I know you've pulled some inspirations from uh, the Hammer films. Oh, not just inspiration, pretty much flat out lifts. I mean, uh, yeah, the the thing that, as I mentioned, even probably before I saw Hammer, I was a Dracula guy. Um, so Hammer fed that love. I was also a Sherlock Holmes kid. So the, the, as Bill mentioned earlier, the, that feel of Hammer um, is almost as important, if not more important, than what the actual movie is about. I mean, I mean the historicals. They did some modern stuff too. But it's, it's the feel of the Victorian era versus the real historical Victorian era. It's sort of like Western movies. Um, American Westerns, have a, a universe all their own, which is separate from the real West. You can do the real West, but then there's the Hollywood Western. Well, Hammer is the Hollywood Victorian era, and it's carriages and gas lamps and fog and top hats and capes and, and a level of politeness that hides the, the the fury of people underneath and monsters bursting through that politeness and and killing people. And that's the kind of thing I took that I could write Victorian stories that had these Victorian sensibilities, but I didn't have to get bogged down in all the elements of history because I'm writing fantasy. And, and Hammer is a marvelous Bible for that feel, for that Victoriana without necessarily having to worry about how many buttons were on a waistcoat or, uh, or you know, how far, it, how long it took to walk from St. Paul's to Westminster. You could feel the Victorianism without necessarily having to get a PhD in it. So, oh, uh, I, and this is always a dangerous question to ask. And Frazier, you're going to be up for this one first. What is your favorite quintessential Hammer film? 
That is a very, okay, my, I will give you three. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde again, The Vampire Lovers, because it's probably the best adaptation of Jay Sheridan La Fanu's Carmilla, which is about a lesbian vampire that I'm aware of. And I happen to be a great fan of the story. And while it is not typical Hammer, Quartermass and the Pit, which is based on a British mm-hmm. TV series, serial by Nigel Neal, and which I will be covering in my next movie book, it's the best treatment of the idea of gods from outer space shaping human evolution that anyone has done on screen. It is wildly imaginative and compared to most of what was being done in SF in the 50s or the 1960s, way ahead of the time. And it's really good. I have it on my DVD collection over here in the corner Me too. of the more obscure stuff. So Greg, how about you? What What is that quintessential, your favorite Hammer film or films? Well, I will go and do a three like uh, uh, Fraser just did. Uh, Horror of Dracula, of course. And I have a copy of the screenplay right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that, that has everything in it. And, but I have my really favorite is the revenge of frankenstein i consider that a comedy mm-hmm. yes because i they they treat you know the chimpanzee who had his wife you know he had another monkey well what else would he be married to uh that's <laughs> just brilliant um and of course dr frankenstein is uh living and relatively happy at the end. Got to have a happy ending in the occasional film. (laughs) Yes, exactly. How about you, Clay? Oh, sorry, Greg. Oh, uh, no, no problem. Uh, For, for uh, really bad reasons. I love the Gorgon because when you get to the end of it and you see the Gorgon, you go, Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) But that's it, yes. The Gorgon does hold a special place in my heart and may have worked <laughs> its way into some of my own stuff, but that's a different story. Yes. How about, how about you, Clay? Well, I, obviously, Horror of Dracula. I mean, it's, it's, it's the king. Um, you just can't beat the bit where Peter Cushing runs across the table and leaps on the curtains, and then he holds up the candlesticks. I mean... That's it's as good as it gets, but actually probably better as a movie, although not to me, but Brides of Dracula is fantastic. It's a, I mean, it's a well-structured movie. It also has the benefits of Peter Cushing uh, giving a really good performance. Um, I like the Gorgon as well. <laughs> I'm not sure like is the right word. The, the, I, I don't know what the hell the Gorgon is. Um, it, uh, it's the Gorgon. It's a, yeah. it's a guilty pleasure. Oh, it's, it's, I'm not sure they knew what they were making, but it's, it's the strangest sort of weird Victorian fairy tale mishmash thing that's got all the cliches that Hammer used. They probably brought all their cliche note cards in and just tacked them up on the wall threw some rubber snakes on her head and made a movie. But uh, <laughs> those are probably my favorites. Uh, of, well, those are the ones that I remember the best. How about you, Bill? What's that so the, favorite? The film? disadvantage of being last is everything has already been mentioned. I love Brides of Dracula because uh, Peter Cushing is my favorite actor and he's the show in this one. The Dracula, the vampire is actually kind of weak sauce in mm-hmm. that, but it's got absolutely beautiful vampire women. And again, when you watch it at a certain age, and girls are kind of scary anyway. These women were just so fascinating and beautiful and will probably kill you. So that resonated. And that scene, um, just to, to, to piggyback on that, that scene where the, the lady is trying to get the, the new vampire out of the grave, like yeah. she's a midwife birthing something, that's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. It really is. Um, I love the Gorga. 
And, and yeah, for all its flaws, the biggest flaw being the Gorgon, which is a problem when the biggest problem in your Gorgon movie is the Gorgon. <laughs> up, <laughs> up Christopher Lee point, said that too. Yeah. Up to that point, it, it's, I, I think it's got the prettiest color palette of any of hammer's films terence fisher is just a master and it's really cool to see cushing and lee kind of reversing their roles where lee is the good guy and cushing's the bad guy it's it there's so much fun together the two of them uh, under any circumstance but it's it's just such a great film and it's the one time i would not complain if they went back and fixed it like if they did a little cgi i hate it when they colorize films but if somebody wants to go in and actually put snakes that look like snakes not rubber snakes, but actual snakes in the war. I'm okay with that. I will contribute to that GoFundMe. Uh, and the third one, um, I, don't, I, I never know if I'm pronouncing it right or not. Quartermass? Quartermass? Quarter mass. Quarter mass. Quarter mass. Okay. Uh, see, I, I've heard it. I, I always get corrected no matter what I say, but <laughs> I love that film. It's They didn't do a lot of science fiction, but boy, when they did, they could knock it out of the park, and it just breaks my heart that one of the many great unmade hammer films was that they were going to do i am legend with peter cushing in the lead role and it would have absolutely been the best adaptation of i am legend of any that have been done although that's a really low bar so <laughs> yeah they they just were so good and and tell you the truth quartermass in the pit is one of those ones where i'm thinking why has that not been remade although they kind of did it with life force but the less said of that the better I, well, I, I don't know why they, they they haven't bothered to try to go back to that one with with all the effects we have now. Yeah, that would be something. So I'm going to ask this as an open question because it's it, this is the one that I, that always kills me. Is so let's look at all of, of Hammer's legacy. If you did not have Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, would you have had a Hammer Studios? You would have you would they would not have the reputation they do. They could still have a lot of good movies, quirky things like the Nanny and Hands of the Ripper, the Quartermass adaptations. But it would not be Hammer mm. Studios, I don't think. No, no, no. It wouldn't be. We wouldn't be doing this podcast. I don't think <laughs> uh, those those two were just so perfect in their roles both excellent in different ways. Um, Peter Cushing is Frankenstein, the right Frankenstein. Okay, Boris Karloff is the Frankenstein monster in my mind, but Peter Cushing will always be Dr. Frankenstein. And Christopher Lee could take something like The Mummy, where he is literally covered head to toe. There is nothing for him to work with except his eyes, and he still makes it work. He was not just physically imposing, he was an underrated actor. That's it's still amazing. one of my favorites is The Mummy. Yeah. Greg? Clay? I don't think it would be a... Uh, Hammer would have been Hammer without Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. As Christopher Lee got uh, rather tired of playing dracula but they kept on saying but we we need you to play it because uh, the studio is running out of money again again <laughs> and again um but uh peter cushing is one of my favorite actors and i will watch anything with him in it and uh they just made Hammer Studios. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, I think without Cushing and Lee, they would have been like Amicus, um, that sort yeah. of level, which they made some okay stuff, but sure. not Hammer level stuff. Um, and Cushing was my guy too. Um, I mean, I was a member of the Peter Cushing fan club when I was young. So I was I. Uh, did you get an autographed picture? I did, I did. I don't know that I still have mine, but I think I... I think it may have my wallet money. was stolen, and that was the thing I missed the most. Oh yeah, money. Mm. but you know, when I was a kid, I loved the Dracula movies because they moved to me more, um, and I love watching Christopher Lee walk with a cape. But the the Frankenstein movies kind of bored me when I was a kid. Later, when I was a little bit older, I saw them again, and I thought, "Wow, these are these are not. I mean, they're not just hammer good; these are actually really good." These are, and he's he's quite 
he's quite good. He's very menacing and, and, and horrible in most of these movies. I, I was stunned because I never paid much attention to him as a kid, except for the flavor, the Victorian flavor. But then later I realized these are, these are really first rate. First rate. And they also ask questions that you don't really see in most monster movies, you know, like, like the transference of the soul in mm-hmm. uh, Frankenstein right. created woman. Yeah. Which I l- really like, you know, just the idea that this scientist would actually be trying soul transfers. Uh, but, and that that would make that the film at that time. Yeah, exactly. There's even there's even kind of a an arc for the character over the films. It's not right. perfect. It wasn't thought out. It sometimes the continuity is a little wonky. But he starts out as this young, ambitious, amoral scientist, becomes utterly evil by the time of Frankenstein must be destroyed, and ends up as a lunatic. Still doing the same stuff he's done all along, presumably will do it till the day he dies, maybe beyond that. And it's it's kind of cool to see this character and, and that, you know, Hammer got the fact that Frankenstein was not the monster. The monster is often the least interesting thing about the Frankenstein movies. Mm-hmm. Because the monster's not really the monster in the movies, is it? It's usually Frankenstein. I don't I don't know this, but maybe one of you guys do. Um were the scripts for the Frankenstein pictures written by the same person? I don't even know who wrote them. I don't know. Sangster wrote the first two. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure about Evil of Frankenstein. Uh, and I think he dropped out of it by, uh, by the Frankenstein created woman for sure. Um, but the first, the first two were definitely Jimmy Sangster. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to go, I was trying to look and see, and I don't remember. Um, so, so Greg, let me start with you on this one. You know, Hammer films have a very definitive, a couple of very definitive styles and periods as they went along, especially as you got into a little bit of the later stuff where it was ramp up the blood, ramp up the sex. But what is it for you that, when you look, if you had never seen it, you would look and go and say, yep, that's a hammer film. They have a specific sound and the the James Bernard scores, uh, are, uh, are part of that. Uh, uh, they, they've actually done a few CDs of the, um, music from hammer, uh, and you can just turn on the uh, television and you hear it and you say, that's a Hammer movie. So it's it, you don't even have to see it. You just hear it. And um, then when you, when you see it, everybody else has been saying about, you know, the color and the sets and everything. Yeah, once, you, once you've heard it and, see, and seen it, you you are just waiting for the uh, characters that you love to show up. <laughs> Clay, what about you? What is it for you that would define that absolute essence of the uh, of a Hammer film? Well, there's two things. There's there's one that's good and there's one that's that's bad <laughs> to me personally. The good thing is is the look. It's the color. Um, it's the 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 depth and the shadows, and they blend shadows with color. Uh, really well. Um, so um, obviously none of, they're not black and white films, but they can still get that sort of universal uh, noirish feel uh, with a lot of red and a lot of green and a lot of, and they've got that garish Victorian wallpaper going on and the houses are super crowded with tchotchkes, which is historically accurate. The the bad for me personally, and I know a lot of people have spoken about this tonight, it, is the music. And it's specifically the one, there's a, there's a sting that they use. Originally, like when Dracula was running at someone or when the monster was attacking someone, but it seemed like eventually they started using this, this drum 
this this pounding sting, bah, 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 bah. anytime someone like walked to the sideboard to get a drink or <laughs> or went to the window, <laughs> the, that's that music sting would come up and it I went through a period where I couldn't watch Hammer very much because <laughs> that music, that just that music, not the, the other background stuff, the incidental stuff, just that action sting started to to grind my nerves. I, I've gotten back, I've gotten over it now, but uh, for a while it bugged the crap out. <laughs> yeah, it showed up in a, in a lot of things because they recycled their their Yeah, like the, like the creature from the Black Lagoon sting. If you right. if you watch the creature from the Black Lagoon now, it's the same sting and they use it over and over and over and it starts to get a little tiresome. And Henry Mancini was responsible for that. For the creature, oh, really? He was in he was a, in the Universal Music Department, and he's that's where wow. he said he learned how to do a score, and, and he was working on the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> well, it's great, but after about the fifteenth, twentieth time, you yeah. know, just swimming through the water, it starts to okay yeah. tone it down. Plus, it shows it shows up in other movies too, like King Kong versus Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, for you, what is it that just cements and says <laughs> Hammer there's, film? There's, there's two things, and neither one is particularly good, but I don't care. I love them anyway. The phoniest looking blood on the face of the earth. If I ever showed up on a movie set with Kensington Red, this poster paint neon technicolor red blood, they'd kick me off. No one ever bled anything that bright, but that's okay. It, uh, it actually... I don't know. It just works for me. Uh, I, I love the color. I wish we'd never gone away from Technicolor. And the other, and I really can't explain this, some of the worst bats ever. <laughs> I mean, th these folks were so careful about everything, such great craftsmen. There has to be a way of making a fake bat. I know Universal did it. I, I've, I've watched low-budget movies where there's fake bats, and the one thing that always goes through my head is that's still better than Kiss of the Vampire. Or just about anything else that came out of Hammer, you know, they, they were just, whether you could see the strings or not, you knew they were there. But okay, that's all right. Uh, those sins can be forgiven. Frazier? I can't think of a specific feature. It's like the whole thing, the style, the actors, the music, the mood, the look. Although that said, there are lots of films that if I watched them and didn't know they were Hammer, I wouldn't think of them that way. Uh, straight mysteries like Scream of Fear, psychological horror like The Nanny with Betty Davis, it's very good. Or uh, Quartermass. It wasn't until I rewatched it for uh, The Aliens Are Here, which is my next movie book, that it sank in that that was a Hammer. Was it... As someone was saying, they did not do a lot of science fiction, and so my brain would automatically have crossed it out. Yeah, that's one of those things that I that I actually think Hammer films did very well. I loved all the sci-fi that they did, which okay. really wasn't that much. But everything they did had a very, again, had that all-in quality to it, good for good or bad, but it was all-in for it. Um, and I think you see some of that because again, they did so much work with the BBC as well that, you know, you, you had some crossover with their special effects people and the storytelling. And I, I, I've always sort of wondered if that was not part of what contributed to the sci-fi that they did do and the elements that pulled forward was because the relationship they had sort of to the BBC. Um, I'm not sure that they didn't just like, you know, raid the, the pubs and say, oh yeah, we're going to grab you for the weekend. We'll just keep you drunk and it'll be fine. But so let me throw this out there <clears throat> because a lot of what hammer did was they came in and they, in a lot of ways, revived the universal monster movies. They grabbed the characters, which of course, by then were public domain from the stories themselves. What do you think hammer's legacy is with what they did with some of the core monsters, Frankenstein, the mummy, and of course, Dracula. I mean, uh, I, I've seen that there's a lot of influence in things I've seen, especially ar around vampires that, you know, the hammer film seemed to have contributed a lot to what is now considered canon and lore that would have been something that was done for almost convenience of special effects at the time. 
So, you know, what do you guys think about that of their contribution to lore and how how they push these monsters along for a period? I tend to think that they really contributed to the vampire in its in, in a physicality form. Back with Bella Lugosi, it was more the mind control and everything and the will power. But with Christopher Lee, you get the sexiness and the violence. And it's gone on with the, especially with the sexiness, uh, until we get Snack Snackhouse. Uh, um, but basically, the vampire has be- become sort of a messy eater. Uh, and I think it started with the, the Hammer films. If, especially if you look at what do you uh, what was that what we do in the shadows uh yeah. yes yeah i mean i would tend to agree with that um I, I i like both i like the universals and i like hammer um although you still think of lugosi as dracula he really only played it once and he played a couple of other cape type vampires later but um, the the Hammer Draculas are better vampire movies than the Universals, I, I think. Um, Karloff is the monster, so you can't, as Bill said, you can't get away from that. But Cushing, those those things are great. Those Frankenstein's are great. The first Mummy, uh, the Hammer Mummy, is terrific. Um, the Universal Mummies, the Karloff one is good, although the Mummy's only in it for, like, I mean, the Mummy, the right. Royal Mummy, is only in it for a second or two. Um, but it's great. The other ones are fun, like his Saturday morning cartoon mummy type things uh, with, Bell, you know, with, uh, like, Lon Chaney Jr. and so forth. But the one that I don't think holds up nearly as well is the, the Werewolf. Um, they, they didn't do a lot of werewolves. They did the, you know, the Oliver Reed. Uh, Curse of the, was it Curse of the Werewolf? Is that what it was? Curse, of the, Werewolf. Curse yes. of the Werewolf. Yeah, um, which is interesting. Right. It's different. Um, but uh, the 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 Wolfman, the Universal Wolfman, is to me he's still the Wolfman. No one's ever going to to not to knock Lon Chaney Jr. out of his you know furry feet. But otherwise, I mean, I can see them. They're totally different. But the the Hammer stuff is. I don't know if it's equally as good. Dracula, it's better, but yeah, I don't know. I probably would go with Universal if I if I had to bet. I'd probably go with Universal if I had to. I'd have to. I'd have to go with Hammer, and I, I love Oliver Reed's Wolfman. The only problem I have with that movie is there's not enough Wolfman in it. The design is brilliant. Of course, Oliver Reed's a scary guy. You know, just oh. w- whether he's a werewolf or not, uh, you probably get. But his his ferocity, natural ferocity, comes through. And you know, one of the ones that was not successful, Phantom of the Opera. Um, it 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 was one of their few duds at that time when they were pretty much you know batting a thousand. But it seems to me like that's the Phantom of the Opera that they that people have really taken and worked with since this tragic figure. You know, the original Lon Chaney version was a monster. He was evil. He was a monster. There was nothing likable about him, really. And Herbert Lom's version was this kind of sad guy who was done wrong and was seeking fairly righteous revenge. And the love story and the music and everything, I mean, that's what people have taken and run with since. It's kind of a forgotten Hammer film. But they they were just good at what they did. They did one Sherlock Holmes film, and it's one of the best Sherlock Holmes films mm-hmm. ever. Yeah, of course, it's got Cushing as Holmes is great. You got Lee in a sympathetic role and it's got a great hound i mean mm. what's not to love but i tend to think almost all the films of hammer that i love 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 absolutely love you got to give credit to terence fisher it's uh, out of my top 10 favorite hammer films i'm sure he directed seven or eight or nine of them i He's wouldn't sort of the third guy yeah, sorry <laughs> me too uh, are you finished i don't want to step no, yeah i'm done i'm done yeah sorry oh. I wouldn't care to pick between Universal and Hammer because I love them both in different ways. I do think Claude Rains 
beat Herbert Lond to being the sympathetic phantom. You're right, and you're right. Both of them, unlike Lon Chaney and in the novel, are scar accidental star faces rather than born freaks, which is another big difference that's been common since. In terms of Hammer's influence, I think the thing I noticed most is that they showed you can get shocking amounts of gore by the standards of the time in Technicolor, which foreshadowed what was to come. And also that in a horror movie, you can get a lot more erotic than you could get away with in a straight film at the time. And we've also seen more of that since. I mean, Christopher Lee is a much sexier vampire than Bela Lugosi is allowed to be. And somebody said he was the most physical. He is someone I could see sticking his enemies' heads on a pike or impaling them in a field. <laughs> and yeah, there's definitely a physical, sexy quality to Hammer. How much it influenced later movie makers or whether they would have gone that way anyway as society changed, I don't know, but that's what sticks in my mind. So Could, let me ask, can I ask a question? Um, oh, sure. There, here's something that surprised me about Hammer. When I, when I was young, yeah, I saw them on television and they were on broadcast television, not in cable. So they were you know, edited for content on some level if they needed to be. I didn't realize that the later Hammers used so much blood and actually had nudity. I had no clue. And what, what ended up happening was you would get movies that were disjointed because they just had to cut out mm -hmm. a naked woman. And there might be dialogue there. There might be something there that was just gone from the version I was watching on Channel 5 at 1130 on Friday night. And then I would go to magazines like, you know, Famous Monsters or Fangoria, and there were these pictures of these naked women with Christopher Lee. And, <laughs> and thinking, Where the hell is this? I, mean, I saw this movie, and it's not, I don't remember this woman and with blood dripping down her negligee. Did you guys have the same, what, did, or did you see the originals like in the theater and, and know that that's what Hammer was about? I was lucky enough to see the originals in the theater because they would just keep showing these matinees. And, you know, it's the funniest thing. Our parents would drop us off for these double feature <laughs> mm -hmm. monster movie matinees. And I'm sure they thought it was Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Yeah. And it wasn't. It was Countess <laughs> Dracula and, and, you know, vampire lovers, lust for a vampire. Good Lord. Um, it was, it was and, and we were smart enough. I, I wasn't the smartest kid in the world, but I was smart enough to keep my big yap shut. <laughs> yeah that was hysterical mom that was just <laughs> yeah oh yeah boy i laughed <laughs> yeah i saw a couple of them in syndication and i don't think there were anything that had nudity and then the rest i saw i started to see on when when videotape became a thing i caught managed to catch a lot of them on videotape so i doubt i missed anything that got cut out hmm. You know, I well, Greg, I know you went and saw a bunch of the men in theater. I didn't see very many in the, I I think the only one I actually saw in the theater was Horror of Dracula. And I during co college, my mm -hmm. when I actually finally got to see it, uh, but I saw them mostly on television, like everybody else. And uh, I knew that the nudity was there, but being cut out because I was reading the um the monster magazines like uh bill did but uh i also knew that it w that these things weren't making all that much sense like he did and there was a that there were things being cut so i'm really yeah, glad that they're available now uh, uncut oh yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I also believe Forrest Ackerman's claim that they would make three different versions of every movie, one for America, one for England, and one for from Japan. And the Japanese one was supposed to be completely over the top, like the monster and curse of Frankenstein had three eyes in Japan. And none of that turned out to be true, sad to say, because I'd love to see the three eyed monster. <laughs> Forrest Ackerman well, lied about something? <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, Forrest Ackerman, from everything I've ever seen, heard, and everything else, you know, definitively could tell a story. Yeah. Forrest Ackerman, never let the truth. He and Stan Lee are the closest to being exactly who they pretended to be <laughs> of any <laughs> people ever. 
And Forey never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, his star has definitely uh, waned, but I, I have to thank him for putting on the Famous Monsters um, conventions in, I think, 77, 76, because mm. I went to it and I got to meet Peter Cushing, Ingrid wow. Pitt. Yeah. And, and there was Forey with, um, he had the mummy ring from the mummy. He had Bill Lugosi's cape. He, you know, he was just like a walking museum of things. Just he was in his glory. So that was quite an experience for a young man my age. And, and both Peter Cushing and Ingrid Pitt were exactly and precisely as nice in real life as um, they've, they have been made out to be. They were just sweet, wonderful people who didn't have to be as nice as they were. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember watching a lot of them on, you know, just like you, Clay. You know, it was the, the the late night TV. They were chopped up, and you're like, okay, well, what just happened? <laughs> but I had two benefits. Number one is there was a small um, the indie how, art house theater that would show um, a lot of the old classic films and stuff like that. Um. And, you know, you could go in a lot of time. They would show the full uncut uh, Hammer films and Russ Meyer films and, and all this sort of stuff a lot of the time. So you could go catch those sitting in the theater, uncut the whole bit. Uh, and the number two, you know, when, when VHS and stuff like that started coming out, rolling out and things you were able to catch. Uh, so I was able to see a lot of them in the theater, but I've seen, you know, I've seen you, you get to see all the stuff that you missed and occasionally you discover there was a little bit of plot that got cut with the, <laughs> yeah. the blood <laughs> negligees. <laughs> well, when they, and when they did finally uh, restore horror of Dracula, the B BFI uh, British film Institute, they had to go to Japan to get some of the missing bits. So Fori might've been right about a few things. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it was weird, too. There, there were a few that I knew about from Famous Monsters that never got shown on TV. I, I, I don't know how old I was before I finally got a chance to see The Reptile or Plague of the Zombies. Oh, oh yeah. The Reptile is so much fun. Yeah. Hands of the Ripper, I didn't get a chance to see until Ooh. just a few years ago. It was like one of those holy grails that I was always searching for. And I didn't want to get it. These were films I did not want to buy some cheap duped copy that you could get at conventions 10th generation out of focus blurry I, I was willing to wait until the opportunity for a decent copy came along because I didn't want to ruin it there's some films that I've watched under those circumstances because I thought it was the only way I'd ever see them and I wish I'd waited because my first experience with them was really subpar mm. I have too much respect for Hammer to, to, uh, to do that well, one more question for everybody. You know, when you look at Hammer films, and of course now they're talking about, you know, starting to go back into production with some stuff. Um, now that the company has been bought and everything else. But do you think that Hammer films can really redefine for now? I mean, so, you know, Hammer was very much a product of a period of time. I mean, even though, you know, they continued to make movies and stuff after, you know, Really, it was that 50s, 60s, 70s era that defined Hammer Films so so purely. So what do you guys think that would be the Hammer style now? And can it would they? It be very difficult. Oh. Well, no, go <laughs> ahead. Okay. It would be very difficult to come up with a style, I think, because back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, the Hammer films still had this belief in good and evil, I think. Uh, uh, this is just my opinion. They, they saw Christianity as a, for, as a force for good. I mean, especially if you look at something like The Devil Rides Out or the various yeah. Dracula movies where Peter Cushing is, uh, that has, as he described it once, uh, a crucifix salesman. Um, <laughs> But we have lost that culturally. We cannot say, oh, Christianity is an absolute force for good because there's too many scandals going on. And I'm not sure that you can say that about any religion, even Muslims or Jewish or whatever. Uh, 
So that was a real strong part of what made Hammer, that belief in the two opposing uh, forces. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. That's a really good point. No, I, I was going to say, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, Hammer, okay, Hammer, very clearly, there's good, there's evil, there's no gray vampires there, they're, they're just evil. Uh, there's a certain skepticism about authority. The uh, the Burgermeister, the, the head of the town, the, the upper crust, there's a lot of class struggle. You look at something like Taste the Blood of Dracula, and it's all about, you know, these supposed good men of the community who are actually horrifying people and bring all sorts of calamity down upon their children. There's, there's a lot of that older generation ruining things for the next generation. I, I don't think there's any point in trying to bring Hammer back. It was of its time toward the end. It, I mean, toward the end, it got pretty sad. They were throwing everything they could against the wall to see what would stick and nothing stuck. There's some great films that come out. I love Seven Brothers versus, you know, The Golden Vampire, whatever. Um, what was it? What was it? Uh, Keep forgetting the, the title. Golden Vampires, wasn't it? Right, right. And and yeah, that was great stuff. <laughs> it didn't have Christopher Lee, it had a lookalike, but um, yeah, they were just trying so hard. But the, the one two punch of Night of the Living Dead and The Exorcist was that was it for Hammer. The the Victorian thing just couldn't compete. Even even some of the semi successful ones like uh, Dracula AD nineteen seventy two. That's a fascinating movie to watch, by the way, because they were updating it because they, they thought the Victorian thing was so dated. There is nothing more dated than the 1972 sections of Dracula AD 72. The, the Victorian stuff is timeless. It's it's so far long ago that it doesn't ever look like it's gone out of style because it was never meant to be in style. But when you try to make something modern, it's only modern for a few years. And then it's it's old, you know, and not old in a good way. So I don't <laughs> know if there's any way of bringing yeah. it back. Yeah, that movie did look like, how do I? How do we present the swinging sixty? <laughs> yeah, made by Victorians themselves. I mean, it. it I mean, yeah. it's fun. It's great fun, oh, but yeah. it just it looks. Yeah, it's really dated. Peter Cushing in a cravat or whatever he's wearing, <laughs> yeah. swinging Peter Cushing. <laughs> Peter Cushing, spy I think, at large. You know, I don't know that they could. I don't know if they could have a house style anymore. I don't know that that kind of thing works. They've got a lot of intellectual property to mine. Um, and that's what Hollywood's all about these days. You can right. go a lot of years in Hollywood presenting your next intellectual property, even if no one's ever heard of it. If you can say it exists, it seems like you can make a movie out of it. Like, I think... Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter would be prime for a really interesting read. Yeah. Because it's a great idea, but I think kind of a flawed movie. But man, it, they could do some really cool stuff with that universe. I, and they should hire me to write it. But <laughs> Absolutely. On, on all counts. And, and yeah, that, that's a movie that you could see the low budget was beginning to hurt. If that had been made 15, 20 years earlier, that would have been something. I don't know who they would have gotten to play Captain Kronos, but um, yeah, if you're right. That, that's just, low budget, yeah. Right. I do, I honestly don't feel there's a need for a new Hammer or a revived Hammer. I mean, the movies exist. They're available. I think styles have changed enough. It's possible somebody could recreate them, but I don't think a whole slew of movies with that kind of elegance and style would really happen. So uh, why worry about it? There, we have them. We don't need remakes. Except, though, right. upgrading some of the special effects might be nice. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna throw one little mini, one more mini question out there because I can't help it. You know, because <clears throat> we we see so much stuff that's CGI now. Mm. One of the things that really defined Hammer films was how well they did most of their practical effects and the stuff they didn't do well, they just basically said, we know it sucks. Go on. With it. <laughs> um, you know, do you think that, um, I mean, from a, a special effects standpoint, 
when you look at Hammer overall and the practical effects from the day, how many of you really want to see us go back to the practical effects versus the CGI? Oh, 100%. Although, ideally, as a special effects person, I don't hate CGI. CGI can do wonderful things in making practical effects look great. And if you have a half a billion dollars and you're doing Avatar, you can make CGI look 100% real. But if you're in the real world where you don't have that much money, relying completely on CGI is a huge mistake. But it's a wonderful process to sweeten things up and do things that would be very difficult otherwise. It doesn't have to be either or. Jurassic Park is still like the best CGI movie ever made because very little of it is CGI, just the stuff they needed to be CGI. Everything else was animatronics. But those are big and expensive, and Stan Winston is no longer with us. So nowadays, it's pretty much all one thing or another. Although there are filmmakers that are now starting to say, let's go back to some of that practical stuff. Still, the Gorgon needed something. CGI, <laughs> I, sewing actual snakes into her hair. I don't know. They needed something. It didn't work. It didn't even come close to working. <sighs> yeah, I agree with what Bill said. That pretty much sums it up. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Even Ray Harryhausen couldn't have saved the Gorgon in that one. Uh, well, <clears throat> I appreciate everybody coming to hang out and talk about some Hammer films. Fun. Yeah, thank you. But hammer before time. we get out of it, hammer time. <laughs> and yeah, I, just to get, get it in, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he won the spin. He won the wheel. He won the spin. <laughs> so before we get out of here, how can everybody come find your hammer inspired work? So, Clay, um, where can they, how can they find uh, your ripoffs? Uh, <laughs> you can find <laughs> us at uh, clayandsusangriffith.com. You can we we tweet sometimes at, at Clay and Susan, and we are on Facebook individually, primarily Clay Griffith, Susan Griffith, and there's a joint page too. So you can find us all those places. Bill, um, I can I do podcasts at gruesomemagazine.com. We do decades of horror of the '70s and decades of horror of the '80s which unfortunately means there's not a whole lot of hammer other than a few of the last remaining ones in the seventies. And um, thanks a lot for having me on. I love talking about this. Fraser. Uh, you can find me online at FraserSherman.com, Fraser Sherman on Facebook, Bogatier five on Twitter. And uh, you, my books, there's a listing of my books on my website. Aliens are here, which is coming out later this year has some detailed discussion of Quatermass in the Pit. Excellent. And Greg. Okay, once again, um, I don't think I actually said my name when we introduced ourselves. My name is Gregory Ukrin. You spell that U-C-H-R-I-N. And uh, you can find my uh, art on uh, Facebook mostly. Uh, under the name of my studio, which is Ivy Caffeine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's C -A -I -V -C -A -F -F -E -I -N -E. So uh, I drop in every once in a while to show a, a, uh, a preview of what's going on with the ghost story and otherwise uh, an occasional political cartoon. Well, and I have had the pleasure of trying to separate separate this bloodbath. I have been your host, Jim Nettles. You can find me at jamespnettles.com, authoressentials.net, authoressentialsworkshops.com, the Speculative Fiction Academy, and, you know, around Facebook, the Hive is coming, Villainy that's Twitter, and, of course, here Continual. And we will see everybody again soon. Good, Good night. night. Good night. <laughs>